Arguably, it's the most important thing governments at every level do, map out their spending plans for the upcoming year. The public sees the result of the budget process, but rarely hears about what goes into getting to the finish line. Here with more on the making of a budget, Agenda producer Patricia Kozichka. Okay, Patricia, this yes. is, I, I think is going to be interesting because you spoke to four former finance ministers who exactly. have done the job in the province of Ontario over the last few decades. So we'll go through each four and you'll give us some of the 411 yeah. on the background that goes into this. Let's start with Floyd Logren, who was the Minister of Finance in Bob Ray's government yes. from 1990 to 95. What did he tell you? He told me it's pretty much like making sausage, the budget process. Um, he said he found it stimulating but also fraught with tensions. Very dramatic. Fraught with tensions because? There is a lot of politics involved, a lot of um, having to appease caucus, appease the whole party, just St stakeholders, yes, stakeholders, exactly. the base, the whole yep. nine yards. Okay, let's move on to Ernie Eves, who yep. was Mike Harris's finance minister from 1995 to 2001. What mm -hmm. did he have to say? He said it's not an exact science, it's a never ending process, and it's filled with a lot of tough decisions. Everybody pretty much said that it's not an easy job. No kidding. Yeah. Janet Ecker was Ernie Eves' finance minister. Uh, she's actually the first woman in Ontario history to bring down a budget. What yep. did she have to say? She said it is the most critical document for government and that it's the, the time, especially in a first budget, which is super critical, that the campaign rhetoric, rhetoric meets reality. So exactly what we saw with the Ford government, there was a lot of rhetoric about cutting the deficit, cutting the debt. This is the time with the budget that we just, just saw come out where the government has an opportunity to show what it's made of essentially. Where the rubber really hits exactly. the road. Charles Souza was Kathleen Wynne's finance minister from 2013 to 2018. Mm -hmm. What was his view? He thinks it's a very complex, very detailed process. <laughs> it's a living document, one that's assessed every quarter, and it's tough to appease, again, that wish list of many that is brought forward to him. Now, there's obviously a million numbers in the budget, but the budget isn't just about numbers. What else? No, it's not just a financial document. It is a political document. At the end of the day, this is a time for the government to come out with its it's narrative, essentially. It's setting the, the agenda for the, the rest of the term, setting out its priorities, its policies, and it's telling a story. So there's got to be an overarching theme to exactly. every budget. And the yes. one we just saw was protecting what matters most, I exactly. think is what they called it. What helps sell that narrative? Well, for Floyd Lagren, for him, it was very important to find a great writer who would actually write the budget because it wasn't going to be him. He wanted to find somebody in his senior team who could understand the numbers and create a comprehensive narrative around them. And so he reached out to ask who's up for the challenge. There was an economist on the team and he happened to have a flair for writing, a passion for it, and was able to just break down the numbers in a comprehensive way and sell it that way through the story. You really got to, you got to write it in the minister's voice, don't yes, you? Yes, yes. And you have important. to really have a passion, passion for the numbers mm -hmm. because it's a big document, over 300 pages, the Doug Ford, um, budget, Vic Fidelity yes. budget was. So yes. There's a lot there. Yes. I, I don't know if people know how long it actually takes to write a budget. You don't actually go in the week before. No. <laughs> put something on paper and then print it out. This is a long process. You want to take us through it? Sure. So it's a year-round cycle. The way it usually goes, according to the government's website, is right after delivering the budget, the government starts looking ahead to expenditure estimates. It delivers a first quarter update in August. It reviews the public accounts of previous, uh, the previous fiscal year in September. So that means comparing the province's performance with the goals that were set out in the budget. Because they don't always match. They don't always yeah. match. It's, it's like they say, not an exact science. Mm -hmm. They try to do their best, but doesn't always work that way. And then comes the fall economic statement and that's delivered some, sometime between October and November. And that's what we saw, of course, with the new government as well. And then things ramp up in December to February. That's when the pre-budget consultations happen. So the government tries to meet with uh, the public, various stakeholders, and that's when uh, ministries as well make their requests. Uh, so there are a lot of meetings happening during that time. And a third quarter update gets put out in February. And the cycle starts all over again at the end of March. Now, on budget day, the finance minister is the most popular and most in-demand person, mm -hmm. of course, in the whole provincial government. In the lead up to the budget, he's also very popular and lots of people want his ear. Yes, they or do. Or her ear. How does that work? 
Well, they make their uh, they make their demands. For instance, the former minister Ernie Eves remembers having seen two carts being rolled into their, his office. It was filled with just binders upon binders of um, requests from all the various ministries, which can be an overwhelming sight for sure, because he has to go through everything and whittle it down. He compared it actually to say if your your children ask for a Mercedes and a Ferrari, <laughs> you're not going to necessarily. Give them everything Can't that give they want. Can't give you the Mercedes, want. but Can't, how about no. a Chevy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a Ford or something, or something like that. that. Yeah, yes, apropos exactly. of this government, that makes yes. more sense. Um, so, so the ministries all have their asks. Exactly. Who else has asks? Well, I guess they meet with the bank economists. The, and this kind of the, thing? Exactly. The economists yeah. get together. He was also saying he remembered a dozen economists around the desk. All of them have different opinions, and somehow he has to take what they say and make sense of it to come out with an actual decision on how he's going to proceed. So it is a tough process, for sure. There's also something called the Treasury Board of Cabinet, yes. and the Treasury Board is responsible for, once the budget is set, deciding how that money ought to be spent. What yes. role do they have in all this? So they question everything. Say you want to start a new program in your ministry. They are going to ask you all the questions that they can think of because they ultimately need to make sure that this program, this money is going to be spent well. They want to know how it's going to spend be spent, when it's going to be spent, how you're going to make sure that um, there's a measure of accountability. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're in charge of the purse, purse strings and allowing that money to be spent, essentially. Okay, let's just come up with a partial checklist so far. We've got ministers, cabinet colleagues who have yes. their asks. We have bank economists who mm -hmm. the finance Weigh minister in. meet with. Uh, maybe unions, certainly stakeholders, yes. you know. The, um, all the interest groups. Dozens and dozens of all of them. Presumably along the way, there are more informal interactions that the minister of finance has that have some influence, like what? In the case of uh, Janet Ecker, she would actually go to her hairdresser and just ask, ask about business. How's business going? Of course, the thought being everyone who goes to the hairdresser often complains about something in their life, and she's just wanting to get a feel for how things are going for everyday people. Um, there were also uh, examples that I was given of Alan Greenspan, the former chair of the Federal Reserve. He would go to a 7-Eleven and just ask about pop sales. <laughs> he wanted kidding. to know what the what people's discretionary, how they were spending their disposable income, how how those things were going. That because, is really ear to the ground. Yes, Holy very God. much so. And there was another example of, as well, uh, Leslie Frost, which the Frost building, the financial building is named after. He would go to his barber shop in uh, Lindsay, Ontario and ask as well his barber what he's hearing. So That's exactly it's, right. It's really interesting. Frost was the premier yeah. in the 50s and his own minister of finance as well. They called it treasurer back then, but he yeah. had both jobs. Um, what about on the official side? Now that's that's sort of very unofficial and very informal, but more official? What else can you tell us? There was an opportunity for the public to provide input online, and the government had identified five key areas that they were seeking input on. And so that was how to put more money in people's pockets, how to clean up the hydro mess, make Ontario open for business, restore accountability and trust, as well as cut hospital wait times. And you were you were in the budget lockup. You mm -hmm. you heard all the speeches. You did all the interviews, how well do you think they did on the commitments that they identified? Oh, we're turning the tables we're here, are we? Uh, yeah, I'm turning the tables I on see. you. Well, okay, let's go through the checklist. Yes. Put more money in people's pockets. There are tax cuts in this budget. Yeah. Uh, $26 billion, they say, over the next six years. Clean up the hydro mess, a long way away from figuring that out, that's for sure. Make Ontario open for business. Yes, there are corporate tax cuts in this budget as well, so to that extent, they can put a check mark beside that one. Restore accountability and trust. That is something we're obviously going to have to keep mm -hmm. an eye on through the remaining three and a half years of their mandate. Cut hospital wait times. Um, you know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars more for hospitals in particular and healthcare in general in this budget. So if it is spent in a way that is effective, it's got a shot at cutting hospital wait times. As with all things in budgets, as you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So yes. there's a lot of we shall see in exactly. all of this. Exactly, devil's in the details. Right and on. And there are still many details to come. Okay, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. Who actually has the final say as to what's in that budget document? Well, it depends on which government we're talking about. Because uh, when I was speaking with the former minister, uh, Ernie Eves, he was saying that the only budget in entirety that... Um, Premier Harris? Yes, Premier uh, Mike Harris was able to see was the first one. And I'm told that's very rare. because that normally, is astonishing. Yes, normally the Premier gets to really go over everything. But... 
there was a lot of trust between the two. That's also important in this kind of relationship. You need to have a lot of trust for your finance minister because he's second in command and there's a lot of power, there's a lot of responsibility. So you put somebody in there whom you can trust. Um, so just so I'm clear, Mike Harris said that he trusted, er, or excuse me, Ernie Eves said that Premier Harris trusted him so much that with the exception of the first budget, Mr. Eves essentially was sort of left to his own devices to come up with a budget? I'm sure there was some degree of collaboration beforehand, but it's not like he had to proofread everything that was in there line by line, gotcha. as perhaps some, some premiers would want to. So, for instance, um, Mr. Eves told me that he took the liberty to insert some causes that were very important to him. He had a son with dyslexia, and so special education was very important to him, and he took it upon himself to make that a cause and insert hmm. that into the budget, and that funding really grew under the Harris government, actually. Fascinating. So he was very proud of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess we'll hear in years to come how much influence Doug Ford had on Vic Fidelli's budget and whether he exactly. looked well, line you can, by line or just left him to it. People are already saying that you can see a little bit of Doug Ford's influence. There's a lot of the, you know, there was the buck of beer in the campaign, Lots of alcohol Lots in this of budget. Alcohol Lots of alcohol-related so, stuff. License is that plate, Vic trillium. Is that Doug Ford? Yeah. Only they know, but yeah. there's a lot of... Uh, Someday we'll <laughs> exactly. find out, I hope. The budget, of course, I mean, the reason that hundreds of reporters are locked up all day long and not permitted their cell phones, mm -hmm. not permitted computer access, uh, internet access, is that uh, the tradition is that what's in the budget could affect the capital markets and therefore it has to stay secret until the Minister of Finance actually gets up on his feet and starts to read the budget. That's right. How much secrecy leading up to the budget in fact happens? A lot. <laughs> there, the Frost Building where all the budget making happens is under guard by the OPP. And so even ministers who come in to review whatever they're able to get their hands on. They're not allowed to bring their phones. They're able to make sometimes some paper, uh, some pencil edits. So even from within the government itself, there's a lot of security. You have to have your ID. You have to, it's just, it's very high, high Can security. Can I tell you a crazy story yes. about that? 35 years ago, Larry Grossman, who was the minister of treasurer back then, minister of finance, drove to work, forgot his ID, got to the Frost Building, and rather than make an awkward moment for a security guard, literally turned around, went home, and got his ID. Yes, he knows. He knew. <laughs> he did not want to put that security guard in the position of exactly. having to turn away the minister of yes. finance because he didn't have his ID. Yes. Anyway. And so even when the finance minister is traveling, they, the OPP is accompanying him, especially more so than they would normally because it's just, again, under, hmm. uh, under lock and key. And so... Um, that means that caucus doesn't know what is in the budget until they hear it. Oh, that's right. And um, the former minister, Lagrin actually got into a little bit of trouble with his caucus because he had introduced some measures surrounding casinos, some policies surrounding casinos, and caucus was not happy with him. And ultimately, caucus is responsible for selling that budget in their writings. So you don't want to upset caucus. So it's a very gentle, uh, very... There's a lot of push me pull There's you. There's a lot. It's a balancing yeah, act. Absolutely right. So you have to right. please a lot of people, and you can't please everyone ultimately. Yeah. Let's uh, let's finish up on this. What was the what was the hardest part of putting together a budget for the ministers that you talked to? A lot of, many of them said that there's a difference between good economics and good politics, and sometimes it was hard to negotiate between the two. Um, that was the case for um, for Mr. Lagrin, mm -hmm. but as well for Mr. Charles Sousa, Kathleen Wynne's. Um, minister because in an election year specifically there are a lot of demands that are made and he admitted that certain measures that he agreed to maybe weren't his vision but there's so much extra pressure that's put on and the hardest part ultimately is saying no well he basically spent five years telling everybody we're going we're to balance, balance the books, books and, then and then went to the electorate with a budget that was not at all balanced exactly. and, and and had no path to balance for sure for the longest time how about janet ecker she have anything to add on this on the difficulties? Just trying to negotiate the, the different demands that are put on her um, between you, you're be pulled in all directions, you know, this person saying, I want this. And again, how do you negotiate everything? Mm -hmm. And you have to you have to f choose what ultimately goes inside the budget. But it is it is a difficult process. She loved to keep her ear to the ground. She always used to say, what would Mr. And Mrs. Front Porch exactly. Ontario have to say about this? Yes. She really wanted to know how this is going to impact. And that was kind of her guiding light for when she was faced with those tough decisions. Well, that's the lead up to the budget. Now, of course, sell, sell, sell. 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 Exactly. How do they do that? Well, the ministers are going to go out to their writings and try to convince everybody this is the greatest budget ever. <laughs> <laughs> but they have, of course, a lot of opposition, both on the provincial front and this time actually on the federal front, which 
is not as common. But again, we're in an election year on the uh, federal, federal front side, as well. Yeah. So they are going to try to do their best to plow through and still convince everybody that um, this is a great budget. We're going to see still more information coming in coming weeks, coming months, because oftentimes governments save save a little bit uh, of something special for later. So mm -hmm. we'll have to keep an eye out for that. And that's what goes into making a budget. That's right. Patricia Kozichka, thanks so much Thank for that. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.